Ontology, a tumor ontology case. Uh, Mr. Khaled? بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا بحب أشكر الدكتور محمد الأشب على دعوتي للمشاركة في الاجتماع الشهري لجمعية جراحة العظام اللي بتنظمه جامعة بنها أنا هبرزنت ثري كيسز أوف أورثوبيديك أونكولوجي كلهم فيهم ديفيكولتيز في اختيار البروبر ثيرابيوتيك أبروتش أول حالتين هقول لكم إحنا عملنا فيهم إيه والثيرد كيس هتبقى فور ديسكشن First case is a male 34 years old He gave a history of curettage of an osteolytic lesion of the distal humerus that turned out to be an enchondroma This was done in uh, Libya A couple of years later it recurred uh, recurrence kept on growing in 2010, he did another curettage in Libya in which they curetted the lesion and filled the cavity with bone graft substitute and inserted two Nancy nails. However, recurrence occurred faster within a year and then he was referred uh, to our institution. Um, this was the X-ray picture showing uh, a, a huge soft tissue recurrence and erosion of the distal humerus. Uh, CT uh, showed the extent of the local recurrence and how the Nancy nails contaminated the whole medullary canal up to the head. We did staging, chest CT was free, bone scan showed a solitary lesion. A core biopsy was done that revealed that it's a chondrosarcoma grade two. MRI showed that uh, wide resection is possible uh, and it's possible to achieve. A bone scan showed the solitary lesion and the MRI showed the soft tissue extent. Uh, however, the vessels are outside the uh, tumor. And you can see here in the sagittal cut that the tumor uh, actually infiltrated the whole medullary canal uh, inside. Our treatment plan was as follows, to do a wide resection. However, we have to decide whether it's going to be an intercalary or an intra-articular resection. And then to do reconstruction of the resultant defect, which could be an endoprothesis or recycling or an allograft or something else. So we started with doing the resection of the whole humerus, which was contaminated. You can see here the huge soft tissue extent of the mass. And then we decided to do uh, composite reconstruction. We took the proximal part of the humerus, which was intact, and then we recycled it in liquid nitrogen. And then we did the reconstruction with a composite of an endoprothesis and a recycled bone. Endoprothesis for the distal elbow which was cemented into the recycled proximal humerus. And the proximal humerus was resutured the rotator cuff and the capsule to the shoulder joint. Why did we choose to do this? Because we couldn't do a recycling of the whole bone as the lower part of the humerus was destroyed. And we couldn't do an intercalary resection because the remaining part of the distal humerus was so small. And we thought that doing an endoprothesis for the whole humerus would not uh, achieve a good shoulder function. And this is the function that the patient achieved uh, one, year to, one year following the uh, uh, reconstruction. He had a good elbow range of motion, good pronation and supination, and uh, shoulder forward flexion uh, for about 60 degrees and another 60 degrees uh, of abduction and uh, fair rotation in terminal of uh, Part of the abduction for reflection are actually scapulothoracic as well. So this was the first case. Second case is a, a male, seven years old, who presented to us in 2010 with distal thigh pain 
and the X-ray showed the classic osteosarcoma of the distal femur. Staging was done, full X-ray of the bone, MRI, chest CT bone scan, and core biopsy were confirmed in osteosarcoma. However, the X-rays showed that in addition to the distal femoral osteosarcoma, there is another skip lesion in the neck of the femur. You can see it here in the X-ray and the MRI. So the patient received neoadjuvant chemotherapy, and when it was time for surgery, uh, uh, this entailed resection of the whole femur. Uh, bearing in mind that he's a seven-year-old boy, any reconstruction would be one of two things. Either we do him a rotation plasty or do an expandable prosthesis of the femur. Expandable prosthesis are usually custom-made and they're designed uh, specifically for the patient. So this takes about six to eight weeks. So we decided to do a two-stage uh, reconstruction. First would be resection of the whole femur and reconstruction with uh, a, a spacer. And then later on, after he finishes his chemotherapy, we remove the spacer and do an expandable total prosthesis. So we did resection, just sparing the lower part of the condyles. And here's the resected specimen. And we reconstructed, we designed the spacer from the vertebral nail and uh, fitted on a, a bipolar, a unipolar uh, head and uh, uh, cement. And this is the construct post-operatively, and this allowed him to bear weight uh, with crutches so as to maintain the bone quality and to maintain a range of motion of his hip. After he finished his chemotherapy, he was, his chest was free, and we were uh, uh, happy with his oncological outcome. We uh, removed the spacer and uh, inserted uh, an expandable modular prosthesis. Over the following years, he was expanded uh, uh, for about eight centimeters. However, um, Suddenly, he got shorter and he felt a snap. His, his hip dislocated following the last lengthening procedure. And we were faced with another problem. The acetabulum is dysplastic, the hip is dislocated. It's very difficult to reinsert it again close, in a closed reduction in order to uh, achieve a, a stable hip reconstruction, we had to reconstruct the acetabulum. So uh, this is uh, the situation. This is his CT. And uh, we had to prepare an acetabular component, bearing in mind all the several options. To be perfect, if we have a dual mobility, cementless shell, but we had to have a cemented cup just in case, ceramic liner. And this is what we've done. We reconstructed the acetabulum with a mesh uh, and uh, femoral head allograft to deepen the acetabulum properly located. We had to shorten the prosthesis in order to achieve good reduction. So we shortened it for two centimeters and then uh, reinserted everything. This is the post-op x-ray. This is six months post-op, and he's fine with that. In conclusion, when, we, when you do an x-ray or an MRI, you have to include the whole bone to uh, monitor any skips. Two-stage procedure is always an option in a selected situation. There are always out-of-the-box solutions. You have to be ready for all surprises. And teamwork among orthopedic discipline yields more favorable results. We have to communicate, with, we had to communicate with our hip specialist, Dr. Mahmoud Abdekarim, uh, helped us with the acetabular reconstruction. And finally, you, you should not give up when treating bone tumor patients. The final case is something that I'd like your opinion in. Uh, is a male patient, seven years old. He presented to us uh, 10 years ago with proximal thigh swelling and limping. This was his x-ray. 
showing a huge osteolytic lesion of the proximal femur. Uh, biopsy revealed that it's an ABC. And uh, this is his MRI picture, uh, multiple fluid levels. So we decided to do an excisional keratage. We excised a uh, big part of the soft tissue extent, and then we double-breasted uh, the uh, capsule and the uh, uh, periosteum of the remaining bone. This was his post-op X-ray, and this was uh, one year post-op. This was three years post-op, and this is 10 years post-op. Now, the problem is he has uh, limb length discrepancy, five centimeters, he limps, he has a painful hip with prolonged standing and walking. So what do you think we should do next? Thank you very much for listening and waiting for your feedback. Love Professor, Professor Walid David for this very interesting presentation, sir. Uh, if you would like, sir, to, to begin the discussion uh, and opinion on your case, or we, we postpone to the end as you like, sir. I think we should postpone it until everybody so that we don't uh, encroach on anybody's time. And Thank you so much, time, sir. Then, okay. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, we will move now to the uh, second speaker. The second speaker is my dear friend, Professor Aldrich Lenzi from the uh, Technical University of uh, Munich from Germany. Professor Lenzi, you are with us. Yeah, hello. Uh, thank hello. you for this kind invitation. Hello. Uh, hello. It's a, a great honor and pleasure to be with you tonight. Thank you so much. Sorry, I got this email wrong and I didn't record a video of myself while presenting. Good the evening, talk. everyone. I'm sorry for that. Good evening, Dr. Lenzi. All right, I've uploaded the video, so. Good evening, everyone. First of all, I'd like to thank the chairman of this fantastic meeting, Professor Hosni and Professor El Ashab for the invitation and letting me be a part of this. Thank you so much. It uh, really means a great honor to me. I'd like to share the case of a 60 years old male patient of ours with you who presented to his GP with a painless swelling of the left posterior lateral knee. The kid was otherwise healthy, no pre-existing conditions. The GP performed an ultrasound and suspected a bone tumor. The kid was referred to our musculoskeletal tumor unit. Plain films showed an osteoblastic tumor formation to the diaphysis and metaphysis of the distal femur. The MRI scan as per tumor protocol revealed multiple discontinuous tumor lesions with contrast enhancement, predominantly on the bone surface and a small focal intramedullary manifestation, which you can see here in the lower row. This is emphasized by the CT scans showing the extended osteoblastic lesion helically aligned around the diaphysis and metaphysis of the distal femur in this kid. Histopath of an open biopsy taken from multiple locations revealed a low-grade parosteal osteosarcoma. Parosteal osteosarcomas are surface osteosarcomas, a group of predominantly low-grade sarcomas which account for about 8% of all osteosarcomas. Most frequently affected anatomical sites, as in most osteosarcomas, are the distal femur, the proximal tibia, as well as the proximal humerus. In parosteal osteosarcomas, a focal penetration of the medullary canal might be present. 
In the further diagnostic workup, no evidence for metastases was found in our patient. And so um, a plan for this case was a sole surgical treatment by means of a wide tumor resection. Um, I've showed this before. Uh, one challenge in these cases is the reconstruction of the resulting bony defect with a marked mismatch between the cross-sectional area of the remaining supracondylar region as well as the remaining diaphysis. Given the lifelong risk for complications in endoprosthetic re reconstructions, we aim at performing biological reconstructions whenever possible. Here is a selection of options for biological reconstructions, including allograft reconstructions. You can use autografts such as a vascularized fibula, do an extracorporeal irradiation of the tumor bearing uh, bone segment, or use techniques such as the masculine technique or uh, a bone transport. In our case, uh, a combination of an extracorporeal irradiation and an autograft reconstruction was performed according to a modified Kapana technique. Kapana et colleagues described their technique for reconstruction of metadiaphyseal bone defects using a combination of an allograft and an invaginated vascularized fibula. In our case, with a surface osteosarcoma, the overall cortical bone quality was still good and therefore the extracorporeally irradiated uh, tumor bearing bone segment was used rather than an allograft, providing a perfect fit for the bony reconstruction. And this is the surgical technique. In a first step, a segmental resection with wide margins in all directions was performed. On a side table, all tumor tissue was then removed, including the periosteum, which you can see on the right hand side, and a complete curettage of the medullary canal performed, leaving a shell um, of cortical bone behind, which you can see in the middle. All tumor tissue was sent for histopathology, and the bone shell was wrapped with sterile sucker bags brought to the Department of Radiotherapy and irradiated with a dose of 60 grays in a water bath applied within 10 minutes. After irradiation in this one-stage procedure, uh, a vascularized fibula graft was fit into the irradiated shell. The construct was then uh, re-implanted into the bony defect, fixed with a plate, and the vascular pedicle of the fibular graft re to a branch of the femoral artery and vein. These are uh, postoperative films. You can see the perfect fit of the composite graft with the invaginated vascularized fibula graft. And here, uh, an X-ray taken at the last follow-up with progressing integration uh, of the, the graft distally and proximally. The patient is doing very well with full weight bearing and uh, no evidence of disease as yet. Thank you for your attention and uh, enjoy the meeting. Thank you very much. For this very interesting talk. Thank you so much for being with us tonight, sir. Thank you. Now we will move to the uh, third speaker, uh, Dr. Abhijit uh, Saloniki from uh, India. Yeah. Hello, Prof. Thank you, Professor. Hello. Hello, sir. Hello, Prof. Thanks for considering me to be a part of this esteem meeting. Thank, Thank you, you so much, much, sir. 
Dear friends, good afternoon. We will like to discuss our topic expandable mega prosthesis or growing joint. And this work was performed at Gujarat Cancer Research Institute, India. So we will start with the case discussion. It's a 11 years girl with wing sarcoma. The lesion was involving proximal tibia and patient was treated with uh, MRI followed by a biopsy and treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy. So it responded very well. It was a non-metastatic lesion confirmed by PET scan. And we thought that what are the treatment options for this case? So in any pediatric case, the treatment options involving the tumors of extremity means lower limbs, we have treatment options of an expandable joint, a amputation or a modified amputation that is rotation plastic. So in this case, we discussed the treatment options with the patients and uh, in our tumor board meeting. So we thought that there are two, two good treatment options. One is expandable joint, so use of a joint which will grow as per the age of the patient. And second will be rotation plasty. So the case was planned and we thought that expandable joint will be a good option for this patient. And what is expandable joint? So expandable mega prosthesis is a joint which grows as per age of the patient and it is having its own generations. So first generation joint was described in 1976. It was an invasive type of joint. Secondly, a joint is a minimal invasive type of expansion, which is a growing joint. And third type is non-invasive type, which is using a magnetic method or magnetic coil. But in our current case, we use the second generation joint, which is use of a minimal invasive technique and small screw is there. We have to unturn few threads so that the joint will grow. So the planning of this case or uh, another case, so we have to prepare a CT scan of the patient, get a CT scan done with fine cuts, get an MRI done, plan the resection, what is the resection, discuss with the implant company, what are your treatment options and what is the expansion required for that case. This is the case, what we will be discussing, proximal tibia tumor and firstly we will preparing a CAD design so computer aided design is prepared and what is the resection length that is planned then 3d printed model of the bone is prepared so this is how the 3d printed bone is prepared and exact dimensions are got with the help of computer aided design and the joint is prepared so this is how the joint looks and it can be assembled interoperatively all parts are fixed so it's not a modular joint there is a Customized jig. So, this is an example of expandable distal femur mega processes. So, on the left side, we can see the parts which are going into the femur, and on the right side, the parts are going into the tibia. So, this is how the joint is lengthened using a warm drive mechanism, which is encased in the shaft of the tumor uh, processes. And this is the telescopic implant, which can be extended by help of a screw. And this is the video which can we were able to see that the part is expanding and we are turning the threads of the screw with the help of a screwdriver. And this is the maximum expansion that can be achieved. So maximum expansion with expandable joint is up to five to six centimeters. So if we are expecting more length dis limb length discrepancy, this method is not useful. So we'll be sharing the case of proximal tibia, which we are planning today to discuss. So the indication of customized joint, it's for young patients, pediatric patients, and this is a minimal invasive type of joint. And this is how the expansion is performed. So we are, we are unturning the threads of the screw with the help of a screwdriver and the part is growing. So this was the case, proximal tibia treated with Ewing sarcoma, treated with neoadjuvant chemotherapy with good response non-metastatic tumor. This is the incision which was planned, which incorporates the biopsy scar and the resection length was 12 centimeters. So the biopsy scar was removed and the tumor was in blockly dissected, showing the neurovascular bundle. This is the resected specimen, how it looked. And it was sent for histopathological examination. And these are the parts of the implant, which was customized joint and this was assembled on table. So this is the assembly done before inserting into the limb of the patient and this is how the resected specimen looked and the expandile mechanism and we are showing how we are 
closing the expanding area of the patient. So the medial gastrocnemius flap was raised to cover the implant and the extension mechanism was repaired so that the patient will have immobilized knee for one and a half month. And this is the final x-ray how the expandable prosthesis was done. And growth will be achieved with this joint. Next, we will be discussing a second case of total femur expandable joint. So this is the case, 8 years girl with pain and swelling over the thigh for three months duration. And it was suspected by an orthopedic surgeon that it was aneurysmal bone cyst, a benign tumor. And he put nails, so Ender's nailing was done. And the swelling increased in size after the surgery and the patient was referred to our center with this x-ray and the patient with a huge swelling over the thigh. So we thought that we should bang our heads because it's a rotted sarcoma and biopsy showed it's heaving sarcoma. We had to do the metastatic workup for this patient and it was non-metastatic lesion. So the treatment options again discussed with the patients and our, our tumor board meeting. And we thought, thought that we will give new agent chemotherapy to this patient. And if it responds well, we can do limb salvage surgery for the patient if feasible. So if we read this x-ray with a good minomic we had prepared. So it's A to Z of bone tumors and we have published this paper. So it's A to Z RAM, a radiographic assessment method in the radiographic journal in January 2021. So we had used these features. A is age of the patient. The patient is skeletally immature. B is bone. Which bone is involved? It's a proximal femur involved in metaphysis and diaphysis, which was an ill-defined lesion, osteolytic with a wide zone of transition and periosteal reaction was seen with some soft tissue mass and it doesn't look to be a benign lesion. So that was misdiagnosed by the initial surgeon and it was a malignant lesion. And this can be avoided with use of this method of A to Z RAM. And this was the X-ray of the patient post neoagent chemotherapy and the surgery was planned for this patient. Expandable megaprosthesis that will be a total femur type of expandable joint. So again, same mechanism was used for developing the implant. CT scan was performed and CAD CAM technique was used. A 3D model was prepared and implant was designed. So this is the biopsy scar, lateral biopsy scar, which was incorporated in the surgery. This is how we resected the tumor with good margins. And here we can appreciate there is nail protruding out of the proximal femur. This was a resected specimen, which was cut with the help of our pathology friends and it was margin negative. It was wide resection of the tumor and this is how the customized expandable joint was placed. So this is the photo showing on the right side the joint is implanted and this is the screw mechanism invasive type of screw mechanism has been used. It's a minimal invasive type. Every time you have to give a small incision and it will expand the limb of the patient. This is how the expanded area looks after expanding. Upper part is expanded, lower part is closed. And below we can appreciate the sciatic now also. And this is the short video showing how the expansion was performed intraoperatively for this patient. So it's a minimal invasive type of total femur expandable megaprosthesis. So it's an indigenous joint which is developed and prepared in India only. And this is how the expansion is performed for this patient. So total six centimeters expansion can be performed for this patient. And this is the expansion, how it is closed. So this was the first X-ray of the patient with total femur expandable type of joint. We had small complication in this case, hinge pin backed out and on the uh, next few days after the surgery, the hinge pin backed out. So we had to give small incision again and we had to put this hinge pin back again at its original site. So this is the lateral incision for expansion which we are doing every time for this patient and total four centimeter expansion has been performed for this patient. We are having four years follow up of this case now. So this is how small incision is given and the screw driver is placed and we perform expansion for this case. So these are the IITV images, how the expansion is performed, the method of expansion for these cases. This is, we are using small needles to know how much expansion that is exactly performed for these cases.
So this is a scanogram of the patient and here we can appreciate on the left side the x-ray shows the affected limb, the length was 28.78 centimeters and on the right side expansion performed for this patient was 2.8 centimeters. The complications anticipated in this case we can have proximal femoral migration so the hip joint proximal femur may dislocate from the acetabular area that can be one anticipated complication so for this case we had prepared a head size which can be exchanged in future when we achieve good prognosis of this patient so it's four years follow for this case now so this is how the girl looks after 3.5 years follow and three expansions have been performed for this case this is the video showing of this kid. This is the knee flexion and knee extension. She is able to flex her knee and extend her knee. Able to walk without support. There is small limp for this girl, but still she is able to walk, climb stairs upper side and going downside without a support. So the take home message from today's case discussion will be we can we should read the excess very properly a uh, easy method can be used that is a to z ram age bone bo borders characteristic distribution exterior of the bone various relation pathological fractures and modern expandable joints can be easily used for pediatric patients thank you very much we are still learning Professor uh, Salonki for this uh, very, very interesting talk. Thank you so much, sir. Now we will move to the uh, last speaker, which is a very important speaker, very eminent professor, Professor Mohammed Abdrahman from uh, Anshams University. Uh, professor Mohammed will speak about a very important uh, topic. Professor Mohammed, please. Resect and reconstruct uh, uh, aggressive tumor, either uh, aggressive Janssen tumor or sarcoma in the first metatarsal, uh, and the technique of arthrodesis of the MV joint. Uh, 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 my presentation today is about uh, uh, how to resect uh, the first metatarsal in presence of benign or malignant tumor with arthrodesis by a fibular graft. Uh, to reconstruct the skeletal defect of the first ray. Uh, I, I will present two cases. The first case is a malignant tumor, and second case is an aggressive uh, giant cell tumor of the whole metatarsal. There is no rule for keratage in malignant bone tumor, uh, as uh, a recurrence rate will be high, uh, and there is no safe margin. So wide resection, of the whole uh, metatarsal is recommended in case of primary malignant bone tumor like uh, osteosarcoma or even sarcoma when uh, it is not invading all the compartment of the uh, foot. And also Janssen tumor of the first ray is very aggressive and uh, the current rate after keratase may reach up to 90%. So uh, it is recommended from the start to do an aggressive uh, lesion, wide resection like the malignant tumor as the critage is not an acceptable form of treatment. And in some cases, in block excision and re amputation can be uh, used for recurrent cases. Uh, although uh, mutation may prevent recurrence, it is cosmetically uh, deforming and decrease the function of the foot. Uh, and the, the first case is a male patient, 32 years, presented by painful enlarging mass uh, over the last three months in the first metatarsal. And here's the X-ray showing a destructive lesion with soft tissue extension occupying uh, nearly the whole first metatarsal. And after evaluation by full radiology uh, with MRI, showing the uh, lesion is contained with soft tissue extension around the uh, first metatarsal and proved by biopsy to be, and after full evaluation by, uh, uh, by bone scan and the MRI, and a uh, guided biopsy was done, uh, CT guided, proved to be an ewing sarcoma of the first metatarsal. After three cycles of chemotherapy, re-evaluation and staging done, and the uh, disappeared bone with pure osteosis has been a, a good responding with re ossification and the calcification of most of the bone with the residual of soft tissue around the region become well capsulated with a line of cleavage 
from the second and the surrounding muscle, uh, assume a wide resection intra-articular uh, of the whole metatarsal dumb from base to the head of the first ray with complete excision and reconstruction. Here after the uh, chemotherapy, the soft tissue and the lesion has been minimized, indicating both respond to chemotherapy. So, uh, direct dorsal, uh, dorsal medial approach was done with uh, uh, isolation and retraction of the uh, dorsalis medius and the extensor uh, uh, and the uh, flexor hallucis uh, muscle tendon with complete extraction of the uh, well capsulated uh, uh, lesion uh, from the first metatarsal. And here, after complete excision, showing the empty clean bed, and here the uh, base of the proximal pharynges and the uh, uh, um, uh, interior cartilage of the medial uniform. After the newing of the cartilage at both sides, uh, a stratofibular graft about six and a half centimeter was harvested it's laterally from the fibula. And the, after the newing of the cartilage of the medial cuneiform and the head, uh, a stabilization by and one third uh, blade with internal fixation with aiming for fusion. And here the resected specimen showing the articular cartilage and here the well organized calcified lesion indicating both response to chemosary. And here the immediate post-operative X-ray showing the reconstruct with fusion at the MB joint and the distally at the IB joint. And this is the follow-up after six months, after nine months, and uh, this is the latest uh, follow-up of the patient, two years without recurrence with good integration of the uh, graft and revascularization and showing good fusion at the MD joint. The second case is a male patient, 38 years, presented by pimple enlarging uh, mass at the first metatarsal over one year with an old an MRI showing the lesion was a small without its marked expansion or ballooning of the first metatarsal and when the patient presented for me after one year from a, a, the beginning of the history with the marked destruction and the dual osteolysis uh, of nearly the whole metatarsal, except there is a remnant, a small part of the head of the first metatarsal. And after a guided biopsy also, documented to be an aggressive giant cell tumor with a secondary aneurysmal bone cyst. So, in such a case, there is no rule for keratage, as the current rate will be very high. And here is a medial cuneiform showing the expansion of the base of the metatarsal to surround the uh, 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 medial cuneiform. So a blend uh, resection was done uh, nearby here in the latest X-ray just before surgery immediately, showing the market expansion, and there is a shell of bone. So a wide intra-articular resection of the, uh, from the base of the metatarsal and the nearby trans uh, uh, the neck of the first ray done. And here's a clinicalization and during this section and extraction of the uh, first metatarsal. And there is a clean muscles all around. So a small cuff of tissue was sticking around the uh, bone with a complete excision of the first metatarsal, just leaving the cartilage and the small part of the head and the neck of the first ray and the harvesting of the epsilateral fibula and applied in position and fix it by a key wire from the remaining, remaining part of the head through the medulla of the fibula and uh, also this is done by denuding the cartilage of the medial cuneiform and the breast fit fibular graft uh, and a, a fixation by uh, also a one third uh, uh, blade and this is the final after the resection with QR fixation. After three months, we remove this wire, and this is a middle post operative showing the, uh, the uh, fixation by fibular graft and in fibular and one third debate. And this is after six months, complete healing nearly of the fusion of the MB joint and slight subluxation, uh, but has no deforming uh, forces or this ability for the patient and the starting the spontaneous fusion uh, with the base of the first metatarsal uh, uh, and uh, uh, which is the base now by the fibular graft and the base of the uh, first phalanges. Uh, and here after four years follow up complete uh, regeneration and the recorticalization and recanalization of the fibular graft with solid fusion 
at the uh, uh, medial cuneiform base, and here also a partial fusion at the uh, distal uh, uh, part of the fibular graft with the base of the uh, phalanges. And this is the function of the patient. Uh, he is a driver of a heavy lorry uh, and has no disability at all after four years from the surgery. Full, full function, although there is fusion both proximal and distal of the metatarsal. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Mohammed Abdurrahman, for this very interesting talk. Uh, we have uh, seven minutes for discussion before we go to the, uh, the seventh session. Uh, uh, if any questions, and we will start first with the comments on uh, the third case of our beloved professor, Professor Ali Davi. Your opinion, sir. Okay. Uh, 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 I was wondering uh, to remind you about the case. It's uh, a patient who had an aneurysmal bone cyst of the proximal femur that lost the hip with a short neck and overriding greater trochanter. He has five centimeter limb, limb length discrepancy and uh, uh, painful uh, hip with uh, prolonged standing and walking. If uh, anybody has any suggestion how to uh, to treat him, Doctor Walid. Doctor Walid, هل ممكن نشتغل على two stages? تفضل. نعمل lengthening للأول على one stage الأول. Would you please uh, speak in English, sir? Because we have uh, uh, guests from all over the world. Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. We can do it on uh, two stages, sir. One stage is lengthening first. And, uh, and the second, we evaluate the, the hip and maybe uh, okay. proximal femur can be uh, done. That's your opinion. Maybe would it be possible okay. to have a look you at the x-rays again? To, uh, do... Okay, I'll, I'll try to get it. Uh, okay, I got it now. Just a second. Is this shared? Yes, sir. It's shared, uh, sir. It's yeah, shared. Are, okay. Well, okay. Now he's he's seventeen years now, and uh, this is his final uh, X-ray. Professor Lindsay, do you have any uh, suggestions? Well, it's hard to tell. I mean, the kid is 17 now. I think the hip looks subluxed or even dislocated. Isn't yes. If I can, if I'm getting it right. Well, yes. Uh, we, we might have to bring the hip down in a first step. And it's, okay. it's hard to tell if we can salvage the hip or have to uh, put an endoprosthesis in, even if the kid is 17 years old. I think an atrodesis is not a good option. Okay. So, so you'd be more rather than trying to... <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah. I think we have to get the, the hip down. A second option would be, if you don't want to go for an endoprosthesis, do an elicera of hip reconstruction, like a shunts osteotomy and a distal okay. lengthening. 
would be an option as well, maybe. Okay. Yeah, because now he looks unsupported, but he has the shortening problem and the painful condition. So mm -hmm. you, you're you always uh, uh, aiming to, to make him, although he has a problem now, but you want to uh, decrease his problem or make him ambulate better. So maybe biological reconstruction would always be our first choice rather than uh, uh, go for salvage procedures because they're always there that you can take this off and, and do a prosthesis or a modular prosthesis. So I absolutely agree. I think we, we'd aim for a, a biological reconstruction with uh, a chance of osteotomy and, uh, and lengthening. Is there any other suggestions? Prof, arthrosis will be also a good option. So it will give fixed joint to him and it will decrease his pain. Uh, excuse me, I didn't hear your first sentence. Arthrodesis, sir. Arthrodesis will be also, can be a good option for this case. Uh, arthrodesis, okay. Okay, I yeah. understand. Okay, this is another option also. So you mean arthrodesis? Yeah, it will then... decrease his pain. It will give a stable joint. So it will yes. be a fixed joint and it will decrease his pain. Yes. So okay. currently it's an unstable joint. So that is causing him pain. So fixed okay. joint will decrease his pain. Okay. Do you think this you. Is might buy uh, new problems with the lumbar spine and arthrodesis? I don't know, maybe it's a solution for now, but uh, for the future, it, it might be buy you some new problems. Yes, arthrodesis definitely would, on the long run, he's 17, now yeah. maybe 10 or 20 years down the line, he'd have some problems in the spine and in the other hip and knee, you know, so. Okay. Stabler osteotomy may give some length and preserve the hip for some time. Uh, to do uh, uh, an acetabular osteotomy, okay. Yes, redirectional and lowering of the stabler. Okay. And Dr. would you be uh, front of uh, What about uh, two stage? Uh, the first stage is supracondylar distal femoral uh, lengthening to correct the, uh, and restore the uh, actual uh, lens. And second okay. is uh, primary total, arthro, uh, total hip arthroplasty, simple arthroplasty without uh, tumor process. Okay, yeah. and acetabular reconstruction. I think and that acetabular is also- uh, Primary total hip arthroplasty. Uh, one of the problems you will have to consider is if you are going to lengthen the leg without any proximal support, your, your, your subluxation will get worse. Yes. You cannot have a lengthening without the proximal stable support. So doing a lengthening on its own as a primary procedure is fraught with problems. So I would suggest uh, whichever way you go, either a hip uh, pelvic support osteotomy, i.e. Uh, hip reconstruction, or doing a, um, a total hip replacement by, by bringing the hip down, either is fine, whichever... Uh, he prefers and the facilities available, but uh, I wouldn't suggest doing the lengthening on its own as a primary procedure. Okay, totally understood. I think this is also a very valid point. So we, we have to stabilize the hip first and then uh, yes, do the lengthening. Okay, uh, thank you every, everybody for your input. I don't want to take time. Let's discuss the other papers as well. If there is any uh, questions for Professor Lenzi or Dr. Abdurrahman or Dr. Salunki, uh, please go ahead. We, we can allow just one question. Any questions? So Prof, uh, primarily uh, any other treatment options could have been used for this case, means uh, like sclerosant injection in first setting only. For which case? Uh, this case, this current case, primarily means the curatage was done and the procedure ah, was okay. done. So ah, at but... that time, if uh, sclerosant was used, like Ascarol, something like that thing. Uh, we haven't been using sclerosing uh, 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 material for these huge lesions. We've done embolization before for uh, iliac bone lesions. But in this case, the proximal femur was completely ballooned, it was a huge size, and it was also fractured. So uh, it was very difficult to go straight ahead for, uh, for sclerosing with an unpredictable outcome. The patient was not ambulating, and uh, so it was very difficult to take this risk. 
But I totally understand that this is an option that is useful for aneurysmal bone cysts. Yep. Okay. Thank you so much, sir. Thank At you. the end of this uh, session, I would like to thank all our eminent guest speakers from Egypt, from Germany, and from India, and our dear panelists for joining us in this very fruitful uh, session. Now we have to move to the seventh Thank session. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you so Dr. much. Asha. It's been a Please pleasure. Thanks Thank a lot. You. Thank you so much. Thank Take you. care. Thank you, Thank Professor Khalid. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, Professor Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Now we have to move to